Welcome to the Great Song Adventure. I'm Paul Zolo here with my co-host Louise Goffin. Hi, Louise. Hi. It's good to be here. This is 2019. Yeah, we're in the new year, aren't we? It's great. Yeah, we're we're getting right into the 21st century pretty seriously. Huh? I'm, I'm yeah, gonna, we are. I'm going to almost adjust somehow. Yep. So I'm I'm really happy we got another special interview. This is one you did uh, in England, if I got it correct, right? Yeah, this was during. This was in June of last year, so it was last summer. I was at Chris Difford's songwriting retreat, and we did an episode with Chris yeah. from that retreat. That was a good one. Yeah, and this was the same trip, actually. Um, this is with Josh McClory of The Stripes, who's now doing work as a solo artist, and he's from Ireland, and he's 22, and had started his career. Well, he was playing in bands when he was a teenager, and... They got a big record deal and did lots of touring when he was 16 through hmm. to his early 20s. So it was interesting talking to someone so young, and their style of music was so much of a, you know, send back to the mod bands of the 60s and blues rock. And, you know, it was really a refreshing thing to listen to, and people loved them live. And they were basically friends who knew each other you know, when they were 12 and played together and started a band as a laugh, and then it just, they got really good and mm -hmm. suddenly had all this interest. And so now the Stripes is over for good, or are they gone? I, I don't know what, I don't know what the band is doing, but I know that Josh is doing some solo work now, so, um, and I'm very excited because he, he's, he's a great guy, and I met him actually a month earlier in Lafayette, Louisiana, for the first time. We wrote together then. And then I was surprised to see him again in England. Um, and it was the very last day. We were all, everybody was driving away, going to airports, going to trains. And we had had breakfast. And I just said, hey, it would be great if we could have a chat. And we sat in this big, gorgeous room, you know, with high ceilings. And we managed to squeeze in a little bit of time before someone came in and said, Josh, you got to get in the car. You got to go. And, and, it, it was a good conversation. We, you know, he's very influenced by Prince, and we talked about Prince a bit, and we also talked about what it's like, lifestyle-wise, to go into a career when you're a teenager. And I had that experience too, so hmm. we had that in common. Yeah. So yeah, it's a good little conversation. Yeah, it was interesting when we looked up his influences that he really liked classic, you know, great songwriters, and it, it certainly is reflected in their in their songwriting. It's fantastic, yeah. I, I I love going back to that old sound. And also what's so great is that it's very focused on live performance. So with no further ado, here is the interview I did with Josh McClory in June of 2018. All right, I'm sitting here with Josh McClory. Hello. Hi, Josh. And we're, we're in Somerset right now. We're actually sitting in a room... With beautiful light and it's beautiful English summer. Yeah, it's pretty ridiculous. This room, this whole house is pretty ridiculous. Actually, it's uh, like something from a film. But yeah, we've had a really good week, haven't we? We've yeah. done a lot of writing together. So. Yeah, and we've just been at a writing retreat that is hosted by Chris Difford, and we've been writing songs for the last four days. I discovered that you were in this band that played in LA recently. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's been. It's been it's been fun. I've been I've been really busy for about seven years, <laughs> um, about seven years now, and uh, yeah, I've done a whole pile of tour and, and uh, yeah, it, it, this has been great. This has been really good. We've we've, we've met, I, I feel like we've all met a lot of people who we're going to work with. You say that you've been busy for the last seven years, but you're 22 years old, so yeah. that means that you've been busy since you were 15. Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, everything sort of started pretty uh, early on. We'd, um, 
So myself and, and, and our drummer, Evan, have been kind of friends since before I can even really remember. Our, our parents were friends, so we were kind of playing together before we even remember each other. So um, we kind of always sort of knew we'd, we'd get a band together at some point, but we just didn't think it would be so early. And uh, I think when we were about 12, we started like doing a gig or two and then... Oh, and then it just started, maybe like eight years ago, I started to get like busy with gigs. And then it's been seven years of like touring properly and, and, and sort of leaving the country and stuff like that. And not being in school. <laughs> did you not finish school? No, none of us did. So in Ireland, we've got like, it's so the equivalent of like the GCSEs and the A-levels. Is, uh, it's called the Junior Cert and the Leaving Cert. Mm-hmm. And uh, kids are actually doing them right now. But... Uh, uh, three of us, uh, myself, Evan, the drummer, and, and the bass player, we all did our like, G- our junior cert, our GCSEs, but we never did the leaving cert. But then Ross, our singer, Ross is quite, well, he's not quite a bit younger, he's, he's a couple of years younger than me. I'm the oldest, and Ross is 20, he's the youngest, and he didn't he didn't even do his, his junior cert. So, yeah, we took the gamble, but uh, I definitely think it's, I definitely think it's worked out in the sense that, you know, we've got uh, a much more varied and broader experience of sort of living than than 95% of, you know, 20, 22-year-olds. So it's been a great education yeah. in that sense. Something that you could use for writing. Yeah, big time. And, and it's funny, like, I have a little brother who's doing exams right now and, and he's just so fed up of, like, well, he's kind of near the end of it, but, like, he was sort of, he's like, when am I going to use this thing about sedimentary rocks and geography? It's It's, it's like... Although we could use it for some, but he's just like, I, there's so many, you know, impractical things I'm learning. And I, I feel like what's been good with, with traveling, and, and, and you obviously know yourself, is that you just, you're sort of exposed to more people and more cultures. And, and it's sort of, I don't know, my understanding of people in the world, I, I'm kind of, I'm in a nice place with that where I sort of feel like, you know, when I get into... Uh, sort of generic and, and philosophical like it, you sort of travelling makes you realise how small the world is and how similar everybody is and we all have the same sort of worries and stuff and it's good as a writer you kind of like you realise that like or I have anyway like there's five or six things that everybody you know thinks about all the time you know no matter where you are in the world yeah and it's that I mean and where'd you go did you go to, in LA were you in school were you I was in LA? school and, and I I was offered a record deal before I finished high school wow. and the record company said you have to finish high school before you can make a record oh, yeah. they wouldn't let me make one but I was probably good call. chomping at the bit I was like I want to do it now I want to do it now <laughs> Wow, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So what, you were like, what, sort of I was 15, 17. 17? Yeah. Wow, so we actually got quite a similar uh, sort yeah. of introduction as well. I later f- wished that I had waited and lived more life before I made my first record. Yeah, but I'm there with you too. Yeah, it's... you know, uh, well... Do you just let go of that? You or? did it right from the get-go. I mean, you really found your sound from the get-go. Sure, but I think, you know, even just lyrics and stuff, I mean, yeah, do you, do you find out you look back and go, oh, what was I doing? But yeah. but then sometimes I, I, I look at it and I just go, well, I was whatever age, and, you know, it was, it, I was that's just the way it was, you know, like I was writing songs yeah. at, at 16, that's just how they were going to sound, and I mean, I'm kind of, I felt it was a bit weird sort of growing up as a writer mm-hmm. in the public eye in, in some capacity, because... Mm-hmm. I didn't really get a chance to write the bad songs out of there, you know what I mean? Like, that, mm-hmm. like a lot of those songs on the first record are, like, my first songs, my first songs that I ever wrote for the band because we hadn't really... Th- we really had just approached it like a 60s group, like, where we hadn't ever thought about writing tunes because it was just a bit of fun that yeah. got out of hand, really. And we'd done all these shows and people were reacting to the to the live uh, aspect of it all. And, and then... Yeah, when we were talking to labels and stuff like that, they were like, well, have you written anything? And so we kind of scrambled around and then I just wrote a couple of songs. And then they, that ended up being like some of the first record. And there's a there's a part of me, I think the older I get, the, the less um, sort of embarrassed I am about them. I kind of just go, oh, well, they're, they, they are what they are. That's, and then, that's great you're there already. Yeah, well... You're already good. saying, oh, it's endearing. Look at you at 16, writing those songs. <laughs> Well, do you find that though? Do you find that yourself? It or? took me a long time to go. Oh, that's so endearing. I would, I would be it's just hard on myself. And now I look at it like a, a younger person. Just oh, it's, you yeah, know, it's really like a diary, isn't it? Yeah, it's, that's that's kind of 
I think maybe that also is what sort of helped me come to that place with it is that I I kept a diary for the first uh, couple of years of the stripes and it was great but like it was I tried to keep a factual one that was just we played here we did this mm-hmm. and not so much a kind of a feelings one but then I started sort of just you know how I was getting on and how I felt at, at the time and mm-hmm. stuff like that and it's a it's such a great thing because you sort of you look back and you're like oh I was worried about that thing you know or mm-hmm. I was why did I care so much about this and and you sort of ju- it, it it sort of taught me to sort of laugh at myself and and realize like the things that I care about right now in two years I'm probably going to go oh my god like why why am I worrying about all these things like there's there's all this <laughs> there's way worse things to be worried about. <laughs> Yeah, and, and also when you're in the middle of making a record, the things that you can obsess about, mm. you know, it, it really ask yourself, will it bother you in a year? In a year's know? time, if yeah. It, if it won't, is it worth obsessing about? I mean, I, I can think of so many lost nights of sleep, of obsessing over... Over little bits. Lots of bits. Yeah. You know, little bits when, you know, sometimes you're just not, you don't start from the right place and then it goes in a direction and it's very hard to bring it back bring it when back that happens. Bring it back to where it was. It's great when it starts in the right place and it's it's pivoted and grounded from, you know, you know you've got the great songs and you know the arrangements are right and the keys are right and the tempos are right. Mm. It's like butter, you know, it just, it has a life of its, it's own. It's just got, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's, do, do you find, um, do, do you find that, because I, I, I get the same thing where, especially when making a record and I'm like thinking do I really like this guitar part you know for myself or something I'm like am I really going to be happy with this in six months and I find that you know three or four months after the record comes out I'm I'm past it anyway I don't listen to the record anymore I mean when the the first comes out you're listening and going did I get this right did I get this right and then kind of four or five months down the line I just don't it's, I'm nearly by it. I'm on the next batch of yeah. things, and and I feel like that. It, I don't know. It might be helpful. It might be. I, I suppose it, it, I feel it is helpful because you, you know you can't go back and change the record, but just trying to get by it and move on, mm-hmm. you know. And but it's like you say. At the time, you're just obsessing over a bass line, or you're obsessing over. Did we use like you know? Is there too much reverb on this? Thing? Yeah. <laughs> you know. And where's yeah. where's like and the people who listen to it. The, I mean, I mean, a select number of people are going to go. I really like that bass line, but you know, ninety five percent of people just like the melody or the, or the lyric, you know, which in itself I think is beautiful. But um, yeah, it's a funny thing. The things we obsess over, you know. What's that uh, quote? Is I don't want to be a member of any club that wants to have me as a member. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that. It's a Marx Brothers thing. Mm. But I would feel that about the work that I was embarrassed about, like, oh, I was too young, I should not have put that song on a record, or I yeah. wasn't ready yet. And then if those songs have fans, I think, oh, well, if if they want that in their club, then I don't want to oh, be no, part of no, their no. club. <laughs> yeah, and, and then it came around full circle where I realized, you know, all these things have charm and time and space, and to keep overdubbing and perfecting and doing all that makes it not really it it's the equivalent of photoshopping your record it's i think it's good to do things fast i mean i know that that probably sounds weird um because painters you know spend a long time but i think a lot of the work goes under the surface not in the outside world big time so you know if you really study how songs you love are put together and you ingest so them yeah. and you learn to play them. I mean, I find the best thing for my songwriting is to learn other songs. Yeah. I love. It just pours into Subconsciously, you. yeah, yeah. You're just taking all these melodies in and it's like, it's like food, you know? It's, it's like, like food. food. And, well, it's funny because I've been, I've been on a really big Prince vibe for, for the last sort of year and a half, two years and gone really deep into it. And, and the, but there's this great book that's come out and it's by... I hope I get his name right. His name's Dwayne Tudal. Uh-huh. And it's basically every day between 83 and 85. So when he just got off 1999 and he was just making Purple Rain. Yeah. And it's a record of every single day and what he did and where he was or whatever. And it's a really incredible book. Uh, I mean, it's not like he didn't, it's not like he didn't have eggs for breakfast. I mean, it's not that kind of thing, but it's right. just like he was in the studio or he was... But th- this is the thing, you find that like... He was in the studio every day, 
just working on a new song. He just he just spent like two or three days working on a song. Like as in he wouldn't have that. He'd like have a little idea. He'd go in. He'd write the song. He'd like like really go for it, overdub, mix it, finish it, leave it, move on, and not really revisit. He'd revisit things a little bit later, but like. He is that thing. He just do it, and it was done. You know, he got that thought out, or he got that yeah. expression out, and moved on to the next thing. And that's why, you know, people have said that if you were, to, you know, there's enough music of Prince to release one record for the next hundred years, every year. If you released a record every year, it'd be enough for a hundred years. So like that, like that's the level, that's the bar. <laughs> you know, that's I a mean, high bar. And yeah. I mean, it's a high bar if the work is great as it is with him. Of course. And you know, you're, you're driven. It's this is it. It's it's the thing, you know, and and, and the laser focus. Yeah, I, I think that I, I what I've learned and and I've learned that like you can get three really great people in a room, and someday it it, it isn't going to work, and someday it, it is going to work, and and it's sort of uh, I guess like letting go of you know because we we all like. I feel like as artists, everybody holds songs and so as a, such a precious thing because it is because it's our livelihood and it's our life and it's like and time. Uh, yeah, and and I mean it really it, that's kind of what gets a lot of us up in the morning and and so when you sort of have a bad day, it is it is a real kick in the in the shins and and it's sort of like I I've found that the from from a couple of sessions in the last couple of weeks was that. Again, it's just a day, and, and, and maybe tomorrow is going to be a really good writing day, and, and or maybe it won't, I, and I don't already really know. But I have a question. I was wondering, how, how do you, because you were talking about Drive, and, and, and you know, even we're talking about Prince, and, and it amazed me how much he was in the studio, and he, it's like he spent all of his time there, and, and, and he, like, he might have taken like a couple of hours every couple of days to do something else, and... It's a, I think it's a, it's a sort of a drive and a, and a sort of level of professionalism that we all kind of strive to be like. But do you find that you know life becomes is more important sometimes too? And I, and I feel like that's what's weird with with the Prince thing. You know, kind of looking at it from the outside, I go, isn't it incredible that he was in the studio all the time? But then I, when you dig a little deeper, I kind of went. Yeah, but did he miss out on a lot too? And and how do you find that balance between trying to be really driven and trying to go and, and write and be productive, but then, you know, trying to have the life experience to, you know, also have a life, but also to write the, the songs? It's and how super do you find important. That? I mean, you, you can't do it lopsidedly. You can't just write and not have, and not live life. Yeah. And it's kind of classic. It, it is classic. A lot of artists... Art, do art. I mean, I say I write music because I don't want to dance. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's, it's, you know, I feel like, well, okay, I have a better better shot at, at being, this. being good at this than I do, you know, choreography. It is it, interesting. It, it is, it, it, can, it can be a compensation for life. Yeah, no real experience to, to share it with. And, and it's, and again, like, I mean, so we're, we're taking a couple of months off the band and, um, it's been really strange uh, and, 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 a, and a beautiful strange um, because it's the first time I've felt like it's summertime. You know, again, without being overly, I'm, I'm a little bit hungover today, so I'm going to be a little bit airy fairy. But but it had, it's the first time since I was like 14, it's felt like a proper summer where I'm like, I'm on summer holidays. And, uh, you know, the idea of just sort of waking up in my hometown and coming to terms with the fact that I don't have to do anything and being comfortable with that now is a beautiful thing and you get to see your family and your friends and, and it's sort of I like the idea at like four o'clock in the day when I'm at home someone could call me and go oh hey man we're just we're going down to the lake in a couple of hours do you want to come down and I'm, I'm able to go yeah I, I can because I have nothing that I need to do mm-hmm. you know and I, I found it's made me write a lot more uh, in in a, in a hobby sense, mm-hmm. you know, because th- th- these writing weeks have definitely made me feel like songwriting is a hobby again. It was sort of a job for a while, not a bad job, great job, but definitely a job all the same. You know, still working towards you enjoy things. It. Yeah, a job you enjoy, but now, like now, it's just I just like if I I could just find myself at a piano or whatever and just writing a song for song's sake, and it's it's mm-hmm. been a really nice thing. But it's interesting, and and if you like, do you find that? You know, like, like 
do you, do you find like the seasons are a thing? Like as in I don't. It's just sort of all rolls into one, for, or has done for a couple of years. It feels like it's all rolled into one. I mean, apart from Christmas, but like I the de- like the definite. It's summertime now. And uh, mm-hmm. it's autumn now. I mean, maybe it's different in the States because you go well, to I live more. in L.A. and we don't have Oh, you don't have any season. So, uh, but I do get a sense of seasons, and it's a really good point because I, I made a point to note when I got here that it was June. Yeah. Because we're doing this. People may not be hearing this in June, but it's, it's June 15th. 15th today. today, yeah. It's June. We're in Somerset. It's green. We're... We're in the English countryside, and yeah. I made a note that it's summer, and I'm in England, and and you know people are out of, are not in school anymore, because I wanted to think back in the future and go when someone says what did you do this summer, people ask me all the time, what have you been doing since I saw you? What did you do last month? What did yeah. you do last year? I and I have that. a hard time. I'll, I could go through my iPhone, yeah. you know, pictures and go, well, let me look and see what see I See what I was doing. You know, so here we are taking pictures of our lives. Can't really recall, recall what's where happening. we were at a certain time. And I love seasons, and I love it for that reason that it's... Even in L.A., I mean, I can feel when, you know, when it's wintertime there, it's beautiful. Mm. I mean, there's just a crispness to the air, and... It rains more and everything's greener. It's this feel, and it feels uh, it feels right, doesn't it? It's, it feels right. I had a great conversation with a friend uh, a couple of couple of weeks ago. We went to um, there's like a kind of a like a like an ancient Irish. Uh, it's like like we when when we went down to Gla- the Glastonbury site yesterday, and we yeah. we went to all those the, that sort of those standing stones. Yes, there's like a really small version of that in my hometown. It's mm-hmm. only it's actually called. Uh, uh, Fionn McCool's fingers, and it was like this Irish, this legend about this, uh, you know, this Irish legend about this guy called Fionn McCool. But pa- apparently, these five stones just it's just like it looks like a hand or whatever. But we went up to it, and um, we we were talking, and we and we're just sort of it's it's it kind of you go through a few forests and up a big hill and stuff like that, and we just we were talking about how you know sort of at home you feel when you're kind of around nature and you're outside and and you're you know around all of these things and you know or when you're around fire or something like that and and it's it's a really interesting thing to think that like up until about you know i mean it could be 40 50 years ago really like humans in general we didn't have you know tvs or, or or screens you know we didn't have any screens and we weren't really inside a whole pile uh, unless we were reading, but you know, we we didn't have like screens. We didn't really have like not a lot of people would have had central heating. Like everyone had open fires. So our attraction to like fire and 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 the elements, it's Im- it's embedded in us since since humans began. <laughs> you know, since the yeah. since since we've been around and and so we were just talking about how you get this weird sense of like oh I belong here, but it's kind of weirdly familiar being out in a forest or, or being around an open fire mm-hmm. you get this real I get this real sense of calm being around an open fire or you know like like I'm meant to be there and it's uh, and you, I, that's why I was going to ask you, do you feel that when you're when you're sort of out on the bicycle as opposed to being in the car when I you're love plugged nature. in oh yeah, yeah I love nature I, I was I was thinking something this morning I thought what's really saturated uh, everyone and it's it's got to explode the other way I mean, it kind of is in another, in a sense when people are just checking out and tuning out. But everywhere you go, it's pretty much any corner you turn or any time you pick up a screen, we're being shouted out to buy something. You know, Big everything time. has a hook. Yeah. You know, so you don't want to hear any of it. You don't want to see it. Yeah, there's a lot of negativity going on. Yeah. yeah. You know, the internet is practically not. It's terrible. It's great. I mean you can't even get phone service and just complete that your connection does yeah. not work. It's a crazy thing and it's a you Oh I mean be it's here. beautiful. You just yeah. you have to be and, and I mean there's one TV in this house. And it was the first time it was on was yesterday when there was football we're watching World Yeah Cup. we watched the World Cup. But that's the only time I I watched anything where I really had a screen because like you said there's no service and you sort of, you just, yeah, you become really, like, you sort of acclimatise to that really quickly. But I think it's really interesting what you're saying about how we've all sort of turned into consumers by default, just with the fact that we all are plugged into the internet the entire time. Mm-hmm. And, like, the difference, again, if just, like, I just keep thinking about, like, 
30 years ago when there was no internet. I mean, I'm sure, you know, TV, obviously. I think it's like the... It, I guess, you know, it's, it, I suppose it's all our attitudes towards it. And, and I'm trying to slowly figure out how to utilize having a phone, you know, and because it, it's it's an amazing thing. I mean, you can record a record on your phone, you know. There's, uh, there's a couple of young guys in, in, in America. There's a guy called Steve Lacey. He's like um, part of this collective. Or he was like one of the young dudes in uh, Odd Future. But he's just recorded like a whole EP on his iPhone. And it sounds amazing. And it's like, so the fact that you can do things like that and you've got this sort of access to a wealth of information. Um, I don't think we have a guest. Um, the, we've got this access to, you know, all this information and we can communicate with, you know, we can, we can, we can write a song together in different countries if we want it, you know. It's sort of trying to use that and utilise that and sort of not spend my time scrolling and reading the next thing about Donald Trump or the next thing about Brexit or the next thing about what's going on in Ireland or whatever. Like, they, I mean, obviously, I, you know, I'm, there's, there's some really great, you know, information out there about politics and all that sort of stuff. But when you're on Facebook, for the most part, it's, it is just, it's kind of just like a sedative. Like, you know, you just, you're plugged in and you kind of, you kind of look away from the screen sometimes, you know. I find myself sometimes when I'm with the, I don't know if this happens to you, but if I'm standing around in a group of people and suddenly someone turns their phone on or you can see the light of their phone, I instantly look at it. And it's not like I'm, I'm not trying to be nosy, but like my eyes just like, it's like, you're like a moth, like you're just attracted to the light. And we're all just like moths, just like. I think, I think it's actually a biological thing. I, I mean, you said when we're around fire. Yeah. You know, when you're around fire, you feel this calm because... You know, fire was good for us for, yeah. for our survival for a, a number of years keep us warm and I think it's the same thing with light I mean I think television figured that out early big time you know if we see something in the distance that flickers we need to look for our what you see what it is yeah. you know we do look to the light it's really interesting and it's a uh, and it, I, I've I've had a couple of really good conversations with with some friends who were a little bit older than me and I, I mean I guess we were lucky that I think I think I'm actually part of the last generation of kids who didn't have internet as a kid, like from like four to like ten, I didn't use the internet, you know. And mm -hmm. so we were outside and we were like playing football and playing curbs and and and, and we weren't really plugged in at that age. And and even when we started using the internet and we started using you know, Facebook and social media, we came in at a point where, I mean, I guess really everybody else came in at, where it wasn't so saturated, you weren't really seeing all of these crazy, I mean, you kind of see everything on Facebook now, I mean, you see all the light stuff, but you, you can see some really horrible things, and I think for kids now who are born into it, you know, like kids with iPads at three, which is just the world we live in now, but but they, I, do, I think... Our, our generation and obviously any generation you know before us um, is able to just go this is just a gimmick in a sense there's there's also outside whereas now there's like kids born into it it's like it's all they know and I feel really bad it's, for them it's, it's the world when I was raising my kids there was a saying that said when they're watching a screen it's not what they're doing it's what they're not what doing, they're not doing. That's, that matters. That's cool. What yeah. we're not doing while we're doing it is really more important than, than the thing what we're, we're doing, doing at the time. Yeah. And that's like, you know, sc like scrolling is such a weird thing that like we've, you know, when you just scroll on your phone, you just scroll through Facebook. I mean, why? And you look, and it's like, there's got to be some sort of science based in it. Or like, there has to be studies where like we must be getting little dopamine releases like almost yeah, every time you see something interesting you're like oh and it just or a like or whatever it is and you know I and I, I mean I'm just as addicted as anybody else I mean I can preach about it but it's like <laughs> I'm still doing it but it's you, you know I, I, I can scroll on Instagram for, for like 20 minutes just scrolling mm -hmm. through like pictures of things that aren't important and it's like you're saying like what I'm not doing I could be writing a song or I could be like spending time with somebody, you know? And it's crazy when you really, like, think, how much time have we, like, wasted on it, you know? But, like, maybe we'd waste time doing something else. Maybe we need to waste time. It's crazy. And it's, it's yeah, it's something I think we all, I think we're all aware of, and we, 
we can talk to each other about it and say, yeah, I'm pretty addicted to my phone, but we kind of do tell ourselves that we're not. You know, I think when you're sort of on your phone, and I do it in bed when I wake up in the morning. I like scroll, and I'll go like, I'll, I'll look at, I look at the time and it'll be like 9.30. And I'll go, at 9.35, I'm going to get out of my bed, and I'll scroll. And at 9.36, I'll go, at 9.40, I'm going to get out of my bed. <laughs> and you're just doing nothing, you know? It's crazy, you yeah, know? I, I hear it. I, that morning thing, the morning, you know, time vortex that mm. sucks your energy. I know. Before and what are we doing? Why don't we just sit and, like, ease into the day and not, you know, I mean, I, I don't think instant, uh, you know, like, heavy light and information as soon as you wake up is a good thing. I think, you know, I think everyone, like, needs to go for the for the, like, take an hour and do nothing and, and, and have a really long breakfast and, and walk around and drink a load of water and, you know, do some morning pages or something, you know? Yeah. Like, it's... I kind of know exactly what I'd love to do in the morning, but I never do it, you know? That's, I, I love that morning pages, Julia Cameron's thing from her book has just become a, a well-known thing. Ter- a, yeah. a thing. P- even people who haven't read the book, it's... Uh, what is it? The Artist's Way, isn't it? The Artist's Way, yeah. yeah. It's amazing. It's, yeah, it's a great book. And so many people in, in all sort of facets of, you know, uh, artistry have, have used it, like, in, you know, be it painting or, or songwriting or, you know, journalism or whatever it is. And uh, But it's a funny thing. Like, once, you, once you've got the information, you think, it's one of those things that you get these little breakthroughs. You're like, oh, my God, I could do this every day. This is brilliant. But, like... You know, life happens. You just don't. And you forget to do things. You know, I've read this great book. I don't know. Have you read? Have you read The Power of Now? Yes. Eckhart. Have you read the second one? There's one called The New Earth. Yes. It's the one after. And so many little. Um, I mean, it definitely has helped a lot. But there's the, you know there's so many little sort of uh, lines and, and and sort of nuggets you get out of it where you sort of learn to you know how to process other people and how to process other people's reactions and all mm-hmm. that sort of stuff. But you know, just because you know it doesn't mean you're going to apply it every day. And it's like this constant, it's a practice, it's a constant thing. And that's like, like in anything we do, like songwriting or like, you know, relationships or eating food or anything. Mm-hmm. Just because we, you know, we have all this access to information now, that doesn't mean we're any smarter, you know, because we have to, you know, use it. Yeah, in we some have to sense. apply it. Yeah. I feel I need to ask you about working with Ethan Johns. I didn't yeah. ask you that. So, I mean, so many young bands would love nothing more than to work with Ethan and yeah. how did that come about and well yeah well we were one of those bands for a long time um, well we about six years ago when we, when we were sort of signing Ethan was at um, he had like a subsidiary on Warner mm-hmm. and he was really interested in uh, signing us and I mean we were very young we were very na- naive and we sort of didn't really know what we were getting into in terms of the industry mm-hmm. And we had management, and I mean they were great, but they they kind of thought it would be better for us to go with like a major with like Universal and stuff like that. Where, but we we spent some time with Ethan at that time, and, and he brought us up to his house, and we had food, and and we recorded, and you know hung out and stuff like that. And he definitely is one of the only people in the music industry I've ever met that cares about the people he's working with as a as a person. And uh, when we did the record, so so we, we, we hadn't seen each other for years and then we were doing some demos in Real World and he just happened to be there and we kind of, it was really awkward because we hadn't seen each other in years and we obviously didn't sign with each other or whatever and then he actually said to us when we were doing the record, he said, I was about to leave to go home and I wasn't going to come in and, and talk. Uh, you know, he said, we said hello but we we didn't hang out and he was like, I was about to leave and then he just said, you know what? you know, F this, I'm going to go in and say hello. And we, he came in and we were hanging out and he heard the songs and he really liked them and he said, I'd love to do some work. And we said, obviously, <laughs> that's all we want to do. So he came, he was great, he came to our hometown and he hung out for a couple of days and he, I was going through a bit of a, a tough time personally at, at the time, just with, like, sort of being on the road for so long and a bit jaded and a bit jaded by the industry and all that sort of stuff. And he really helped me out in the sense of like, 
he he really like he really made me realize like there, there are people there who care about you and 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 who want you to do well as a person and, and like you know to to kind of see outside of the business side of things and I mean you know yourself that's that's what he's like but no, it was an incredible experience so I uh, I owe a lot to him uh, in terms of my development as a person. That's fantastic. Well, thank you for taking the time. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah. a safe home, or safe uh, journey home. Okay, Josh. Thank you. That was Josh McClory in June of 2018. You know what I love about that so much is he's philosophical, and I, I love I love sitting around talking about how to live well. You know, life choices, prioritizing, because it's not. It, you know, we're here talking about songs, but it's really not just songwriting. It's the person and how they look at life, how they live their life. And mm-hmm. songs come out of those questions. And we're always tweaking our journey along the way, you know, like a plane that goes off course. we got to bring it back in if we want to keep staying healthy and happy and writing, right? Yeah, yeah. That's a challenge, too, to be a songwriter, but be a a person in the world at the same time and how those two come together. It's easier for some people than others. Yeah, I mean, as we were talking about with Prince, you know, he was doing all this incredible work at this incredible pace all the time, working every day, but was quite isolated Mm -hmm. as a person. And, you know, I love that Josh is already asking these questions of, well, really, who do I want to be, you know, Mm -hmm. in my life? Yeah. Seems like a pretty smart guy. Yeah. I love the sound of his voice, too. That Irish accent is wonderful. Yes, it's very soothing. I remember when I, in the episode we did with Chris Difford, he calls Josh a cool cat. Ah. <laughs> which, coming from Chris. Yeah, who wrote the song, right? <laughs> who wrote the song. He's a, he's a cool cat. Well, I love that you go to other countries and get these interviews for us. It's, it's part of the great adventure that we go even out of America for songwriters, which I love. Well, songwriters are everywhere. And certainly Ireland, the home of, of songs and poetry, and you know, it's a country that loves their artists and yeah. gives them tax breaks for writing songs. <laughs> yeah. I wish we had that here. They yeah. get health care too, don't they? Maybe yeah. we should move to Ireland. It's awfully there's beautiful the thing. there too. Yeah, as long as it's not raining and freezing cold. <laughs> right, there's that. Right. Yeah, always. So where can people follow us? Good question. You can find us on the uh, internet at uh, YouTube and Facebook and uh, Twitter and Instagram. I think those are the big four ones. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, come and follow us and hear our other episodes coming up this year. 